Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Suzerain Kingdom of Rizia edition and thank you so much for the support shown on the last episode. I'm very, very grateful indeed and excited to keep this game going, this series going. We're going to learn more of our backstory about Romus Taurus, King of Rizia, our father, our unfortunately deceased wife. And now we need to learn a little bit more about the political side of things, our cabinet and other such practicalities of running an empire. So let's get going. Political overview with the Grand Vizier. The stairway to the Royal Council Chambers was longer than I remembered. I took a moment to catch my breath in front of the carved oak doors. Hurry up, Father. It's not very kingly of you to be late. I am still under the weather, by the way I apologise in terms of my flu, but I, I, I'm getting there now. A true king is never late, it's the others who are early. Yes, a true king is never late, it's the others who are early. But if we are late, we probably shouldn't say that. <laughs> it's very kingly of me to show up whenever I want. Uh, what should we go for here? Uh, just give me a second, that's all. After collecting my thoughts, I pushed open the door and walked in. Everything was just as it had been in my youth. The high dome ceiling with its skylight that shone into the centre of the room. The oval mahogany table, the tall packed red velvet chair where my father used to sit. To my slight surprise, the room was except empty except for one man, my uncle. When Hugo saw me, he sprang to his feet. Welcome, your majesty. No need to stand on ceremony with me, Hugo. Please sit. Hugo sat down with a smile. You'll meet everyone soon enough, but I thought a private chat with your Grand Vizier would be in order first. His eyes travelled to the doorway where Vina was still standing. Although it seems it won't be as private as I was expecting, are you staying, Princess Vina? My daughter gave a shy nod. Yes, Uncle Hugo. I'm sitting in on the King's Council meetings. She's going to learn by experience, just like I did. Hugo frowned as he processed the new information, then broke into a smile. By all means then, your highness, have a seat. Vina walked in over to the table as I made my way to the red velvet chair. Once we were all seated, I turned to my uncle. How have you been? Busy. Managing the royal transition is a full-time job in itself. Between that and visits to Rico and Isa, I haven't had a day off since the funeral. As I listened to him, my eyes drifted towards the back wall. It was covered in portraits of Rizia's previous kings, including a newly painted likeness of my father. My dear brother, I do miss him, but I dare say it's time we had some fresh blood on the throne. As it's been quite some time since you last sat in these chambers, I prepared an overview for you. Would you like to hear it? Um, please, that's fine. We'll go ahead with that. As the king, you're both Rizia's head of state and command of its armed forces. As well as the de jure governor of Rizia, Valenkiris, the palace administrative district, and the island of Kalakabis. Like your father and grandmother before you, you alone have the power to shape this country by passing royal decrees. As is tradition, over hundreds of years, each new ruler has passed the sovereign transition and clemency decree to start their reign. The kingdom will be expecting your decree very soon. The decrees will play a significant role in my reign. They won't be just symbolic gestures, but tools to shape the future. Wield this power wisely, Romulus. The decrees you issue should strengthen the fabric of our kingdom, not tear it. Hugo reached for a neatly rolled parchment lying on the grand table. With deliberate movements, he unrolled it, revealing the prepared royal decree. The intricate script and the seal of Rizia was glinting under the chandelier's light. I and the best of the Royal Council will advise you to the best of our ability and put forth decrees and state decisions for your approval. Ultimately, though, the King has the final say. However, you should not neglect the House of Delegates, the Legislative Assembly my brother set up to appease the opposition after the uprising. Uh, what about it? It still works the way he intended. Rizia has the appearance of a constitutional democracy, or power remains firmly in the hands of the King. His Majesty Valero presided over the last elections in 1949. The Rizia National Coalition secured a House majority, as always. They propose decrees and issue, issue official approvals or disapprovals of the law passed by you and the Council. As Grand Vizier, Vizier, should we go with Vizier or Vizier? We'll go with Vizier. It's traditional for me to attend their sessions and pass any relevant information on to you. 
Thank you for that, Your Grace. I will be counting on you. Of course, Your Majesty. With that said, I would advise you to take the delegates' input into account. No good can come of ignoring the will of the people. I agree. Thank you for letting me know. I'll be sure to listen to them going forward. And I'm here to serve, Your Majesty. Fortunately, the delegate speaker, Daria de Rava, is a Taurus loyalist through and through. She should give you no trouble. Your position is small, but worth keeping an eye on, especially the new leader, Manas Sazen. Hugo gave me a meaningful look. The, the opposition not elected a Sazen, which is one of the three major monarchical families within Rizia, I believe. Uh, Duke Luc Lucas Sazen was executed for his role in your kidnapping and the 1926 uprising, or his wife Angelica was sent to exile. While she remains under strict orders not to leave the island, no such restrictions were placed on her son that she gave birth to shortly after her arrival. He opened a fold and took out a picture of a clean cut young man. Fina leaned forward to peer at it. Upon finishing his studies, he returned to the mainland and proceeded to win the largest supporter base of any opposition leader we've seen thus far. His promises to give a voice to the common man seems to be resonating with the populace, or at least some of it. I'd like to meet him. You'll get your chance. While I'm on the subject, a word about our houses. House Taurus. Our family controls the province of Valenciris as well as the city-state of Isa. Um, and how is it doing now that we're not there as much? Stable as always, with you on the throne, me as Grand Vizier, Enrico and Isa, the governing seat has been filled by Hubertus, a distant cousin of ours. Of course, Princess Vina is eligible to take his place as the reigning Duchess. And he nodded at my daughter. In a few years, maybe. I don't feel ready. You're already smarter than I was when I became Duke, but it's your decision. Vina blushed. Thank you, father. Hugo tapped his fingers on the table. In any case, Your Majesty, I don't expect any trouble in Valenciris during your reign. It remains the wealthiest of Rizia's provinces and the least affected by crime. Keep their lives comfortable, and the locals there will stay loyal to you. Has Rico been well received as Duke in Isa? Hugo's face hardened. Isa has been difficult since the Saison Rebellion, even more so now that the native Rizians are in danger of being crowded out by migrants. He spat out the last word with some distaste. Come on, Hugo, you be kinder to the migrants. Considering the circumstances, I believe my son is doing just fine. It's not migrants who are the danger, it's bigotry. Pardon me, Your Majesty, but I'm only stating the facts. And uh, what about the Rizit Imperi? Imperii? Imperii. It's one of our provinces. We do indeed control that. Yes, Port Adrazen and its metropolitan area are controlled by the central government, and therefore House Taurus. You don't need to worry about pleasing a house in this region, though. It's more crucial to retain the favour of the major corporations that are based here. Right, so Port Adrazen's like the city of London. Got it. Understood if our economy takes a hit, another uprising won't be far behind. Precisely. The Palace Administrative District is also under the jurisdiction of Rizia Imperii, since we reclaimed it in the early 20s. Got it. As for the other houses, we'll talk about House Caesar next. Yes, aside from Isa, which is now under Rico's governance, all of Brennas is still under their territory. The nobles there swore fealty to the crown in exchange for keeping hold on their cities and their estates. But the return of Angelica's boy could test that loyalty. He is their rightful duke, after all. He cannot be a duke and claim to represent democratic values at the same time, which I think is true. A contradiction, isn't it? He discourages his fellow delegates from using the title, but has yet to officially renounce it. Lest we forget, Wehrlin is scheduled to return Zeal to Rizia next year. The Saisons expect the region to become part of their province as it was before the uprising. Can you, I, I think we can use it as a bargaining chip. Stay loyal to the crown or no zeal for House Saison. Now you're thinking like a king. Thank you, Hugo. And House Cesaro to finish. The rulers of Cadesse Montecla and the stewards of the Rizian military. You must be aware of their patriarch's Stadius poor health. The general suffered. Suff oh my goodness, can't speak. The general suffered a stroke shortly before King Valero's death. 
I had no idea. His daughter, Lucita, the Duchess of Montecla, volunteered to take his place as war and security counsellor. You'll meet her soon. Okay, so she's kind of head of our military, gotcha. Someone to keep on side for sure. You should also know that the factions within her province have started beginning calling for the return of Palas again. Ooh. Uh, why? They're powerful enough already. No matter your feelings on the subject, I advise you to take the house's concerns seriously. Hugo glanced at the clock. Well, I hope this was helpful. One more thing. As you're aware, a few years before your father's death, he reinstated the Golden Guard. Right, the personal security of my father, and where are they now? Here, sir, ready and able. So, Titus Gordion, Captain of the Golden Guard. For the first time, I noticed the man standing in the corner of the room. You didn't notice him, a man standing there? I guess not. He was wearing a tight-fitting gold blazer that barely contained his muscular physique. Meet Titus, Captain of the Golden Guard. He and his men have been keeping close watch on you since the coronation. I'm pleased to meet you, Captain Gordon. Call me Titus, sir. Titus and his dozen men have been trained in the upper echelons of Rizia's elite military and police academies. Each has sworn an oath to protect the king and his families at all costs. Are they guarding Vina and uh, the Queen Mother as well? Yes, my eyes have uh, my men have eyes on the Queen Mother as we speak. He bowed to Vina, and she looked a little flustered. But didn't Queen Liza continue the discontinue the Golden Guard? Because she thought they made royalists look elite, or royals even look elite, elitist, and because she trailed off, because she thought they were getting too powerful. So our current force is less than a third of the size it once was. Your father always had a fondness for his tradition, so he spared no expense in bringing the guard back, albeit in a reduced form. He humbles me to be worthy of such an elite unit's protection. The immunity is all mine, sir. Thank you, Titus. You may wait outside in the chambers until the meeting's conclusion. Titus nodded and swiftly left the room. He's going to be someone that we need to keep on side. <laughs> We don't want a Praetorian Guard situation happening. Noon already. Shall we and young heiress break for a glass of wine before the council convenes this afternoon? Gladly. We just have much to cap up on, catch up on. I think your father kept a store of vintage Cantuavo in one of these cabinets. Thank you for the invitation, Uncle Hugo. He turned to look my daughter in the eye. What an intelligent, well-mannered young woman you've grown up to be, your highness. I know how overwhelmed the capital can seem compared to monkeys. If you ever have any questions, don't be afraid to come to me. And Vina smiled politely. That's very kind of you, Uncle Hugo. Listen to your Uncle Vina, he knows how everything works around here. What is my grand role as grand vizier, if not to advise the royal family? Vina finished jotting down some notes as Hugo went searching for the wine. Okay, so we've got some decrees available. Royal decrees, here we go. So I've got none enacted. And H, the one that I sign is some authority down. Uh, but we also get to see the approval of people, which is quite nice indeed. So by this decree, I could affirm the transition of the crown with the Taurus lineage from King Valero to King Romus. This decree upholds the revered traditions of the monarchy, ensuring the con Continuity and stability of the dynasty. Concurrent with the auspicious transition, his inaugural act of clemency extends a royal pardon to 500 individuals convicted of minor offences. Minus one authority, but I think we'll sign that. I am indeed sure about signing it. So, stat decreased with our authority, but I think that's a good one to do. Right, next one welfare. Ooh, this one's a little bit less. <laughs> easy to get through our kind of supporting people. So, an ambitious housing programme is dedicated to the kingdom's homeless and is grappling with extreme financial constraints. By guaranteeing housing for every citizen, the state reiterates its commitment to uni unity, prosperity and social harmony. Such endeavours are anticipated to cement public trust and ensure tranquility across Rizia. 
Okay, the religious side would approve, as was the Council of the Treasury, but two disapprovals as well, with Lorento being in neutral. Right, I'm not sure we're quite ready for that one just yet. Now what about construction? This one seems a little bit better. But this one is expensive, in both authority and budget. In homage to our ancestral heritage and to boost the tourism industry, the Kingdom is launching an excavation and restoration project to resurrect the historical sites of Topes, a landmark of the ancient Resonid Empire. With the city's excavation and restoration, we anticipate a renaissance of cultural pride, boosted tourism and uplift in public sentiment. I don't have much budget to work with already. And that takes a while two turns to get that enacted, so we're not going to start that just yet, I don't think. We'll see what else goes on. We'll meet some of our council. It was late afternoon when Vina and I headed back to the chambers for the first council meeting. The day was hot, and my head still felt slightly fuzzy from the wine we'd shared before lunch. I knew I was about to receive a lot of new information from my councillors. I hope I could keep it all straight. As we crossed the palace gardens, I had the feeling I was being watched. Suddenly, I noticed a young man standing next to the path. His face matched the photograph Hugo had shown me that morning. Duke Saison, I presume. He smiled nervously. I hold no land to your majesty, but if you want to use that title, you may. It is brave of you to approach me. A, that can be a compliment as well as a non-compliment. He turned at his suit lapel. I want you to introduce myself before our first official meeting. I may be the leader of the opposition, but I'm not your enemy. If you and I establish a dialogue, I believe there's much we can accomplish for our country. Vina gave him an encouraging smile. How lovely of you to say that. I'm Vina, by the way. He resisted the urge to laugh. I know. A pleasure to make your acquaintance. I wish I could stay and talk, but the princess's time must be going. Until next time. I look forward to your majesty, your highness. Vina walked as he wa waved as he walked away. I wonder if Vina and him are going to have a little relationship. He seems nice. He's friendlier than I expected. I can imagine working together. We continued towards the council chambers. Oddly enough, I still felt like someone had their eyes on us. I looked back and for just long enough to see a flash of gold. Titus, of course. We entered the chambers where Hugo was already waiting for us. No sooner had we sat down than a brief rap came on the door. Without waiting for an answer, Lucita rushed in. The new war and security counselor was younger than I'd imagined, just past her mid-thirties. She carried herself with a mix of regal elegance and soldierly authority. Soldierly authority. Gentlemen, pardon my interruption. She bowed towards me. Please accept House Azara's formal congratulations on your coronation, Your Majesty. I motioned for her to stand. Her eye was fixated on my uncle's shirt as she raised herself. Hugo, Your Grace, your shirt's buttoned wrong. My uncle looked chastised. Oh, hello, Prin hello, Princess Fina. Would you like a colouring book? She's part of this court now. I advise you to be more respectful. It was meant as a joke. I meant no disrespect, Your Majesty. She gave Vina a wide, Vina a wide smile. Please don't mind me, Duchess Cesaro. I'm here to learn and observe as the royal heir. Lucita's brow wrinkled, then she gave a curt nod. So I see. General Taddeus sends his regards, or he would be if he were capable of speaking in full sentences. She was trying to be flippant, but I could sense emotions beyond her words. Uh, this must be difficult for you. Let me know if there's anything I can do. The corners of her mouth twitched downward. I'm not a porcelain doll, Your Majesty. My ability to perform my duties is in no way compromised. The others should be right behind me. I didn't mean to insult you. I apologise. As if on cue, I heard the voices of Elena and Lorento, my treasurer and counsellor of foreign affairs. For does sake, Lorento, you don't need to hold the door open for me every single time. I'm not as fragile as I look. I keep telling you, how could I allow a door to close on such a gorgeous face? I remember their flirtatious routine from my days on my father's council. Nobody knew whether the two of them had actually had an affair. On seeing me, they dropped the act and assumed a look of deference. 
Lorento smoothly removed his fedora, uh, revealing a well-oiled mane of grey hair. Your Majesty, it is a pleasure and an honour to be in this room with you once more. Elena nodded, her business-like demeanour briefly softened as she looked at me. I must say it makes me proud to see you in that seat. Between your time with this council and the fine work you did in Valenkiris, I can't think of a better man for the position. No need for flattery with your years of experience, I should be the one bowing down. That's far too kind of you, Your Majesty, but I hope us old-timers can be of some assistance to you. Elena looked fondly at Vina. I'm pleased to see the young heiress here as well, a new lies of the great in the making. Vina blushed. I wouldn't go that far, but I do hope that you'll tell me about your time in Queen Lisa's court one day. Lisa's court, even. I'd love to. There are just a few updates I've got to share with your father first. Once all the councillors were seated, Hugo began. Thank you for joining us. I'm pleased to have the entire council here for this first meeting. Well, not the entire council. The Grand Wiseman is in Plavo, preparing for the upcoming religious ceremony with His Majesty. But he need involve himself in earthly concerns like the Royal Treasury. He smiled at himself and then gestured to Elena. No, indeed. That's for me to worry about. She put on a pair of half-moon glasses, reached down into her purse, pulled out a thick, leather-bound ledger, and flipped it open. Surely his majesty already has some awareness regarding the state of Rizzi's economy and resources. I do, but I'd like an update from you regardless. Certainly, your majesty. She smoothly adjusted her reading glasses before continuing. Rizzi is still one of the wealthiest countries on the Mokopan continent, but his majesty, the late king, bequeathed us as a number of challenges in that department. Where should I start? Start with the government budget. It's always a good place to start. Which is not hugely positive. It's healthy, Your Majesty. Since we began trading with Rumberg, we've been running a surplus. One that's quite high for our region, though of course there's plenty of room for improvement. His Majesty King Valera was hesitant to increase government spending, perhaps even too hesitant. No need to sugarcoat it, he was a miser. He had his reasons, I'm sure but he did miss a good number of investment opportunities that would have enriched our nation further. Including, of course, the opportunity to completely modernise the Rizian military. Helena pursed her lips. With all due respect, Duchess Cesaro, I'm not sure the military is the King's number one focus. Hmm. Who do we want to annoy? We can't, I mean, this is just factual. The last time Rizzi had a strong military, its members mutinied against us. That was many years ago, Your Majesty, and all the responsible parties have been punished. I do agree there are better uses for these funds. Think of the advances we were able to make during the Liza era due to the Queen's investments in citizen welfare. You'll recall her famous quote. True prosperity is not defined by the amount of gold in our coffers, but by the health and happiness of each soul within our borders. On the other hand, there, are no, there is no welfare without security. What good is health or happiness if we're unable to defend ourselves? Let's try to keep everyone on side. Hugo put up a hand. I will point out that Rizzi's wealth and my mother's judicious handling of it was one of the factors that allowed us to survive the century of revolutions. However, those were different times. As a modern nation, in an era of increasing superpower influence, we were expected to have a certain standard of military. You're right, Hugo. I will indeed take the Duchess's suggestion seriously. I'm honoured, Your Majesty. Your enthusiasm is heartening, Duchess Cesaro, even if I personally believe our spending should be directed elsewhere. Any further questions, Your Majesty? Uh, what's been going on with the gold industry? Well, Your Majesty, gold is still the backbone of the Rizian economy. We have a number of active mines within the country, operated by the Rizian Royal Gold Corporation. She and Hugo exchanged glances. Unfortunately, we cannot talk about the corporation without its CEO. Uh, we better get that discussion over with. For better or for worse, the country's gold stores rely on Rosello Montoro. Hey, Rusty. Who insists on making a Rusty, uh, currently owns 70% of the Rizian Royal Gold. Uh, how was that allowed to happen? 
It's not royal if a businessman owns it. Good question, Your Majesty. He looked at Delena. Rossi's first move after taking over the company was to assure to sue your father's government for loss of revenue connected to the zeal handover. After a lengthy back and forth, it was agreed that the kingdom's share in the corporation be decreased from 45 to 30%. Rizia should not own 30% or... Uh, I, want, I want the original state back if I can. Carry on our favour with Rusty and it should be possible, but any more than 45% will be difficult, so we don't own a majority. The patent for RRG's property mining technology was filed, filed. Inventory City, Arcasia, most of its financial assets are kept in Kairut. In other words, attempting to nationalise the company would strip it of a substantial amount of its value. RRG might may control mining with Rizia, but the royal government is a direct stakeholder in the Neftium International Trade Zone. She rolled a map on the table and pointed to a region in the east of Morella. The double blow of losing our mines in Zeal and 50% of our RRG is taken as most quite reliant on the gold from the mitts. Lauren Toast, his moustache. It was established shortly before you joined the Royal Council, was in Lot Elena. I had the negotiations between Rizia, Vagasland, and Espia and Morella took over a year. Can we uh, increase our mining efforts? We can try. There are a number of promising sites that have yet to be explored. We just need to give RRG permission to begin excavations, which might involve the uh, ex appropriation of noble property depending on where the mines are located. When I saw Hugo went to that remark. And when we get Zeal back, would its gold come back to us as well? I certainly hope so. Wellen has been mining extensively in the region since taking over in 1927. But as the, by the terms of our agreement, Zeal and all of the resources therein will return to Rizian ownership in 1952. And at the time of our last survey, there was much more than 30 years worth of gold in the ground there. Okay. I think we can get a decent thing from how we go there. Uh, let's talk about our energy. Elena smiled. Of course, Your Majesty. This is a new area for us compared to gold, but the financial possibilities are intriguing indeed. She pointed at the map in front of her, this time directing our attention to the southern coast of Valenkiris. Though our state energy company is called Rizian Oil and Gas, production of the former has slowed over the years and is threatening to come to complete halt. The latter, however, shows potential. Our most productive gas field is Escuris off the coast of Topes. Assuming enough money is invested into expansion, we can expect it to fuel our kingdom for years to come. Or we can spend our budget somewhere uh, as we wait for access to the new field south. Careful, Miss Werner. One shouldn't count one's pheasants before they're bagged. Um, what field would that be? Elena looked at Lorento, then at me. Well, we're still in the extremely early stages. We may have at least part of a claim to a substantial reserve of natural gas between the port of Palace and the recent island of Calacabes. Uh, um, we should proceed very, very, very carefully indeed. We don't want to cast dispute in our hands. Wise words, Your Majesty. Our researchers have been investigating the field's size and borders. Once these are known, it will be easy to determine ownership. Of course, we are liaising extremely closely with Paddis to avoid misunderstandings. As well we should. No one wants to repeat of the last conflict. Absolutely. Indeed not. Um, if the Grand Duchy does not provoke us, we will not provoke them. Let's go with that one. Lucita nodded. As much as my family is clamouring for a repeat of the palace campaign, I think it's best to ignore them. Of course, if palace shows hostility towards us, we will react in kind, but Rizia should not be the first to resort to aggression. Which I agree. Fina tentatively raised her hand. I don't know why we're even discussing military response. We surely will be able to reach a compromise using proper diplomacy. None of these I want to say. All these are all terrible things to say. Um, I, I, I think in real life there is always a winner and loser, so I'm going to say that. Although I didn't want to say it in such a rude way. But no, no matter. Time to grow up, my dear. In real life there's always a winner and a loser. Oh, but... 
we should save this discussion for if and when we know more about the gas field in question. For now, are there any other questions? Uh, how much of our revenue comes from taxes? Our resource-based economy allows us to have some of the lowest tax rates on the continent to be a real boon for the economy. The central government does collect a flat income tax of 10%. This is mostly paid by workers since nobles have no income to speak of. That seems doesn't seem fair. Low earning workers pay taxes while nobles don't. I don't make the rules, Your Majesty. They're proposed by the House of Delegates and agreed on by your father. A 10% tax is a low price for commoners to pay for the privilege of living and working in the best country in Mercopa. And our family's investments power half of Riz's business anyway. Why ask us to pay double? Hmm. We probably do need to keep the nobles inside. You have a point. We shouldn't disincentivize families like yours from supporting Rizzi's economy. Think of your own house, Your Majesty. Would the Rizzi wine industry be where it is without our backing? In terms of our province's individual contributions, the GDP in Valenciennes is off the charts thanks to the wine, gas, and tourism industries. Brennas is still suffering the effects of the loss of Isa and Zeal. However, it's making advances in shipping and agriculture alongside its gold mines. The manufacturing concerns in Cardes and Montecla are doing very well, to the point that business councils are complaining about an imminent shortage of skilled workers. A shortage of Rizian workers, Elena. These vacancies could easily be filled with migrants from Whelan and Derdia. That is a slippery slope. Are you familiar with Rizia's two-tier employment system, Your Majesty? Uh, please explain it to me. After the Whelan Civil War, we began granting labour hand visas to Wesak, migrants and a smaller number of Derdians. Labour hands may accept employment by Rizian Industries, but they don't have the right to social security or other benefits, and there is a cap on how much they are allowed to earn. They now make up most of our blue-collar workforce, with higher paid jobs held by native Rizians, as well as the smaller numbers of Lesbians, Vegaslandians and Lombergians. The programme did wonders to the economy when King Valera initiated it, but as a result we have now millions of workers in this country have been treated like second-class citizens. I see where you're going with this, but granting them full unemployment rights would lead to a flood of uncontrolled migration. I'm not so sure about that. The situation in Wayland has stabilised since the Civil War. Rizzi offered Vesex asylum when other countries did not. There must be some limit to our generosity. Perhaps, but I do worry that having a growing army of disenfranchised labourers will lead to unrest down the line, which is very true. Very possible, Your Majesty. Allowing migrants to earn more money would curb the kind of black market activities that have been taking place in a city like Isa. Do you not fear the dilution of Rizian culture and values, such as Azaro, or the infiltration of da uh, Dasnuris and Golcondis into our society? She shrugged. Societies change, Your Grace. I don't recall those concerns being raised about the Rumbergians who moved here after our alliance. Well put, Duchess. I can only tell you're going to be a brilliant addition to the Council. Thank you, Your Majesty. I saw a smile play across her lips, whereas Hugo stayed silent. And then looked uneasily at the three of us, and she tapped a pencil on the table. We seem to have veered off track. Can we get back to your questions about the economy? Uh, no, that's all I need for now. Perfect, Your Majesty. Elena looked down at her notes, her expression... A cont contemplative, I really can't talk. I'd like to discuss several economic considerations. We should anticipate potential expenses arising from impending fiscal policies. Please elaborate. The first point to consider is industrial growth. I'm all for the expanding production and construction, but we should make sure we have the energy to keep our facilities humming. How are we doing on energy at the moment? Still doing okay. Secondly, there's the matter of living standards. Improving the quality of life for our citizens naturally leads to higher administrative expenditures. Thirdly, if you do decide to listen to Duchess Cesaro and expand our defences capabilities, keep in mind that the cost of upkeep of our armed forces will rise accordingly. Lastly, energy management poses its own challenges. As we approach the limits of our grid's capacity, we may incur additional storage costs. This information is invaluable, Elena. I appreciate your insights. Frankly, I'm glad to see you're taking an interest in our financials. Between myself and the House of Delegates, we were able to keep everything running smoothly in the absence of clear guidance from your father. But with the king of your calibre at the helm, there's no telling how high we can soar. 
Your hard work during my father's decline is to be commended. Thank you. It was indeed quite the stressful time for everyone. I think that's enough for today. We have to come to a decision regarding the development of our resources. Gold is where most of our profits are coming from today and holds a special place in our history. But to maintain the natural gas would be a more fruitful investment. I'll let you think about it, Your Majesty. Thank you, Miss Werner. That was indeed enlightening. A pleasure to share these chambers with you once more, King Ramos. Yes, I'm looking forward to our upcoming security briefing. And congratulations on surviving your first council meeting, Your Highness. I found it fascinating, Your Grace. They smiled at each other, although not too sincerely. My counsellors left, and I sat for a few more minutes reflecting what Elena and the others had said. Oh, that's a lot more decrees, goodness me. Okay. I'm going to have to deal with these decrees one way or another. That's a lot more that we can do. So let's have a look at what we might want to think about. Public transport requires a lot of budget and authority, and it's not hugely popular with Grand Vizier or Secretary or Councillor of War, and it's also one NG per turn. But it does mean that people get to move around a little bit quicker. Public rail transportation subsidies, again not particularly popular, and a lot of budget down per turn. Same with the sea. Well, they're not, noticeably not quite as expensive. So we could go for that. Uh, what about naturalisation process for foreigners? So we get 100 plus manpower per turn, but authority goes down a huge deal, goodness me, as well as the budget. And again, Lucita and Hugo are not all too keen on signing such a thing. What about the hospital? Everyone can get by in the hospital, surely. So, the Kingdom greenlights the foundation of the Porta Drazon, Romus Taurus Hospital, with cutting edge medical amenities and dedicated research zones. This institution vows to provide unparalleled healthcare to Rizians. Furthermore, it stands ready to provide, to provide a medical base for wounded military personnel, reinforcing the nation's defensive capabilities. That's interesting. So, only, authority only goes down one. Project goes down by two, but that would still leave us with three. Because I don't know how long each turn is. It is a two turn construction. And no one actively dislikes that, so that's one I'm going to probably go for. But let's also have a look at the university. Uh, we could decree the founding of a new university, a beacon of higher education research, this institution. We dedicated to fostering academic excellence, innovative research, and the pursuit of knowledge across a wide spectrum of disciplines. The establishment would also contribute to the defence industry's research and production with it its technical faculties. Furthermore, it will be equipped to prepare future leaders and thinkers who can contribute significantly to the nation's progress and uphold the intellectual heritage of our society. That one's nice, and also gives us military agreement. I'm not entirely sure why Lucita would disapprove, to be honest. We're not going to be able to enact every single decree, that's for sure. I don't want to assign anything too controversial straight away. This one's nice, Housing for the Poor Initiative. It's only one authority and budget down. But both Hugo and Lucita would not approve. For now, I think I'm going to do this one here. So one authority and two budget down. But it also goes our military manpower up as well as per turn. And it takes two turns to construct. So I will sign the Royal Decree to establish the Roma Storus Hospital. So we've had a little more stats decreased. But we have an assignment started. Wonderful. So it's under construction. Good. Good, good, good. <clears throat> so, we will arrange a classical concert for the noble houses. As a gesture of refined taste and celebrate the cultural heritage of Rizia, there is a proposal to host a classical concert featuring the renowned Rizian composer Antonio Geria Albeni. Such an event could serve as a testament to the monarchy's commitment to the arts and reinforce its prestigious image amongst the noble houses. No. It's nice, but I want to spend my money on you, on things to do with the economy 
with welfare, with housing, with business, with transport. I can't spend one budget on a concert. I spent too much money last time in when I last played this campaign. I need to be a little bit better and a little bit more... I would say a little bit more fiscally responsible. Um, so we've got one order, one construction decree done. Still lots of royal decrees we can sign in just yet. But for now though, we'll head down to Plavo. So festivities are the way for consecration of the king. Jubilant street festivals adorn with colourful banners and lively music engulf the city. Religious processions featuring revered artefacts and clergy we through enthusiastic crowds, heightening the anticipation of King Romus's impending consecration. And the Ark Sanctuary is deemed safe for ceremony. Despite the recent structural damage to the Ark Sanctuary, inspectors have certified that the traditional consecration of the King's ceremony may safely be conducted. However, an extensive restoration is being recommended before this important place of worship, and the final resting place can be um, of the disciple can be open to the public. I agree. So we can go for the consecration of the king, but I think we'll do that next time, as we have had a lot of political decisions to make today, or at least kind of understand. We've put through a couple of royal decrees, one in order, one in construction. Plenty more to go yet, but I want to be wary of my budget and my energy and my authority so i have to see how things go in the meantime thank you so much for watching take care bye bye